Um, I, I had a, you know, the, the blessing, the privilege of having to call out an air conditioning uh, technician this past week. Um, that's always fun. Um, I, I'm, Latani and I are suspicious that our, our, um, our unit is finally ready to be replaced. You know, big deal, right? $8,000 to $10,000. <laughs> What, what's to worry about? Well, anyway, he came out, and it was a guy I'd not met before, and we were out there talking, and, and I told him, I says, look, I, I really, I want to nurse it along. I, you know, we just, that's a lot of money. Um, so he gave me some, some advice, and we, uh, we, we, we tinkered with it a bit, and he got us up and running again. How long it'll last, we'll see. It's like putting Band-Aids on it. But I'm telling you this, not because you care about my air conditioning, but um, the conversation we were having out there as we were talking, you know, we, it obviously started by talking about how expensive everything is. You know, the, the prices have gone up on everything. And of course, we know the reasons why. Our world condition is such that there's a lot of instability. And we got to talking about these things. It came up quite naturally as we, uh, you know, as we were out in the, the side yard there talking about our air conditioning. And, and he, you know, he, he made some statements that got my attention. He said, ah, I just don't know what's going on. You know the things that people say. I just, this, uh, who knows, this world seems crazy. And we got to talking in a very natural way about the troubled world that we live in. And I was able to offer a couple of little statements of, of hope, you know. I'm glad God is in control and, you know, can tell these are the times of the end. Those kinds of statements, you know, that are always good to make. And, and uh, you know, I got to thinking about that in connection with what I wanted to share with you today. And it's certainly true. We are living in very, very unusual and strange times. Um, you know, there's an old Chinese proverb I've always heard, you know, may you live in interesting times. I think this qualifies. Um, what could be more interesting than living in the last days of Earth's history? Uh, maybe to be standing on the earth to see Jesus come in the clouds and not having to taste death. This is, this is a real possibility for everyone in this room. Would you say we live in interesting times? Uh, but you know, we, we also know that be, because times are so interesting, there is a lot of hand-wringing going on, um, and rightfully so. Um, I did a little Google search, which is always interesting in its own right, uh, on a top, I, I, I don't remember exactly what I put in the search bar, but something like a top 10 world crises or something like that, top crises the world faces. Anyway, I got back some interesting returns. I wrote a few of them down. So, so um, uh, you know, we're going to find that much like Stephen Callahan, the story I told the children, we are on very troubled waters Okay, uh, top crisis, uh, according to, you know, Google searches and so forth, uh, the war in Ukraine, a very, uh, very, uh, um, you know, consistent return, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, worldwide pandemic, still in the grips of that, uh, food shortages, you've heard all these things, right, food shortages based because of famine and global conflict and all the things associated with that, uh, gas prices, soaring gas prices and energy prices, um, energy shortages, etc. Uh, right now, they, uh, according to the UN, there are more than 26 million refugees around the world, displaced families and people, over 26 million. And uh, according to the UN, again, this is the highest in recorded history. Inflation, financial instability, gun violence. I don't need to go on, do I? We recognize that this is not just something that uh, Google threw at me. This is something we see and hear about every day because we live in a troubled world. We live in a world that is in crises. We are on troubled waters. But I, I, I encourage you to think back to what I shared with the children just a moment ago. We're on these troubled waters, but what are we looking at? Are we looking? Are we fixing our attention? Are we focusing on that jagged, uh, extreme, rocky shoreline? Or do we have our eyes on the rescue fishermen? And Jesus is our fisherman, isn't he? Oh, but pastor, he was a carpenter. Yeah, he was a carpenter until he was baptized and anointed by the Holy Spirit. Then he became a fisher of men, Right? which is what he's called us to be. So we have a rescue fisherman of our own, and we need to keep our eyes fixed on him. We need to stay attached to him in these troubled times. And it occurred to me uh, that, you know, if we know um, that we're in these critical last days of Earth's history, and I do believe we know that, don't we? I, I, I don't 
think I need to make a case for that this morning, other than what I already have. If we know that we're in these troubled times, then how shall we live? What kinds of lives should we be living? Uh, should we be spending our time in hand-wringing or in some other fashion? Well, let's go to the Bible together and find out. And let's pray together, and then I'll tell you which verse to turn to. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you so much for giving us the Bible, for giving us the insights that are found within its pages. And today, as we spend some time studying together, we would ask for your mercy uh, and by way of the Holy Spirit. Give us understanding. Give us courage. Uh, help us to see what it is that you intend for us to see this morning. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, our, our scripture reading today, go ahead and turn there. This is uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. And what we're going to see here is that uh, this reveals to us the essential activities Listen to my words now. The essential activities of God's people in a time of trouble. The essential activities of God's people in times of trouble. I'm going to put the, uh, the scripture on the screen today. It's the only scripture I'm going to put on the screen today. Okay, so have your Bibles ready. But I am going to put it on the screen just now. If that button will work. There it goes. All right, so uh, this is uh, New American Standard Bible is what I'm using. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? Now, Peter is not afraid to just talk very directly. I love his two letters. How he talks very frankly, very directly. This is direct language. Um, he's talking about the melting of the earth, right? I mean, he's not holding back. And so um, notice the context, though. Uh, I'm going to highlight it here. The context, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, uh, if you were to go back, and you can see it in your own Bibles, go back a few verses, he's talking about the Lord's return. Jesus is coming like a thief. He's talking about the, the elements melting, etc. He's talking about the end of the world. And so that's the context of the question. What sort of people ought you to be? Which is the inspiration for today's title. How shall we live? What sort of people are, if we know we're living in the last days, if we know that we're looking at the return of Christ in the near future, what sort of people ought we be? We don't have to wonder, the Bible tells us. It lays out, a, to me, a very practical, very clear outline. And I want to look at that outline with you today. Just keep reading. I'm going to highlight it on the screen here. It says this right here. This is our answer. In holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. He asks the question and then answers it immediately. And I find a lot of hope here because this gives me something I, can, something I can grasp, something I can hang on to as I watch the world around me uh, fall apart. And I hope that this offers something for you too. So let's just walk through this a little bit. Uh, what's the first thing we see here in his, uh, in his little outline? Uh, in holy conduct and godliness. What sort of people ought we be if we know these things are true? How should we live, right? Well, in holiness and in godliness. We need to be, let, let me be more direct, we need to be Adventists. Now, is that fair to say? Are Adventists supposed to be a holy people? I, I believe all Christians are called to be holy people, right? So certainly, uh, Adventists, we are called to be a holy people, right? Uh, we, we, but don't we believe in Christ's second return, or in, in Christ's soon return? Well, of course we do. It's right in our name, right? So if we know Jesus is coming back, then living holy and godly lives needs to be consistent with, with Adventism, right? Because that's what Adventism is about, pointing people to the return of Jesus, hoping for the return of Jesus, uh, living these kinds of lives. We need to live, quite frankly, like we believe he's coming back. We need to live like we believe what we say, now, now that's, really, that's really easy to, to say from up here, but so often uh, I wonder if we really believe what we teach. Do we really believe what we say? Do we believe what we claim? I'll never forget, Pastor Steve, uh, one of my first churches. Now, now, you don't know which church I'm talking about. This was in another conference, and I, I pastored four different churches in another conference, so you don't know who I'm talking about. Uh, but I remember sitting up there uh, very early in my tenure, 
And uh, the congregation stood up to sing the opening hymn. And uh, we, the, 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 I'll never forget the, uh, the song. It was, it was uh, number 633, When We All Get to Heaven. I should have a, uh, here has got to be a, a, a hymnal around here. Let's just read some of the words of this. 633, um, you know this song real well. Now, I don't have it memorized, so that's why I'm struggling to find the right one. Here it is. Uh, sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Right? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. And it goes on in this tenor, in this tone throughout the whole. It's a beautiful hymn. I probably should have chosen it for opening hymn. If I would have been thinking, I would have chosen this, this song. But as I looked, we're standing there, and as I looked out, not you, I promise, not you, but if the shoe fits, wear it, I suppose I could say, but I looked, and, and the, the words we were singing did not match the faces that I was seeing looking back at me that Sabbath morning. When we all see Jesus, just... And it, and it just, it, I've never forgotten that moment. It just struck me like a lightning bolt. I don't believe they believe it. Now, I knew they did because I knew that I was getting to know the folks. I was early on. But, but by looking at them, it didn't, it, it didn't seem to me like they believed what they were saying. Now, what did I expect? I don't know, I, you know, but something different. It just, you know, going through the motions, it's like, oh, we've sang this song a thousand times. Yeah, yeah, Jesus is coming back. Yay, right? And I'm glad that I've not forgotten that moment because I've tried to live my life and try to present myself as, as being excited about something, right? Being excited about something. You know, what we teach and preach in our communities is good news. It's something to be, you know, excited about. It's something to be joyful about. And we need to live our lives as though we believe it's real, and um, so I, I think that this is what Peter is suggesting here. We need to live our lives in holy conduct and godliness. How would, how, would, uh, how would God want me to live in my community knowing that Jesus is soon to return? How should I live my life? You know, if we did a, um, if, if, if we, if we did a Bible study on holiness, we would find some things here on holy living and purity. I, I encourage you to do this. Just look it up. Look up all the times it talks about I mean, there's, there's thousands of references, so, you, you know, you, you probably won't be able to do an exhaustive search. I wasn't either, but I found some interesting, some patterns, and I'm going to share one of those patterns with you. Listen to this. I've got, I've chose three verses. Just listen. This, if you want to follow along in your Bible, Psalm 15, 1 and 2. Listen to what the Bible says. Okay, this is Psalm 15, 1 and 2. Uh, Who may dwell on your holy hill? Now, let me stop. There's a question there. Who may dwell on your holy hill? So what's the question? Who may dwell on your holy hill? And Jesus said, who's going to be in heaven? Who's going to be with God? Who's going to stand with Jesus, right? And dare I say we could rephrase the question, who's going to be saved? Who's going to stand on God's holy hill? So there's the question, right? So let's, let's answer the question. Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. Right? There's, there's a certain conduct. There's a certain way of conducting oneself. According to the psalmist here, these are the ones who spend time with God on his holy hill. Those who have a heart like God. Right? And it goes on and on. Psalm 24, verse 3. Look, notice the pattern. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? He asks. This is Psalm 24, verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And now the answer. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. And that pattern continues again and again all through the Psalms, all through the Scripture. It's, God's, it's, a, it's a holy people. It's a godly people that stand with God on his holy hill. Doesn't that just make sense? We are called to be different in this world. And that's all that holiness means, right? Holiness is to be separate from what is common. And let me assure you, we don't have any, we, we don't have any need to be common in this world. Because what is now common has been lowered so far that, um, 
you know, it, even people who, who don't have the hope of Christ's return recognize there's something wrong with this world, right? So we want to be separate from that. Uh, listen to what Jesus says, Matthew 5, 8. Let's just go right to the teacher himself. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure, for they will see God. So this is good advice. This is a good answer from Peter, right? Uh, what sort of people ought we to be knowing that Jesus is coming back? We need to live in holiness and in godliness. And by the way, this is, this is not a new truth. These, these psalms go way back. This is long before Jesus walked the earth. Okay? These are, this, is, this is what God's people have always been asked to do. It's not a new truth to live in holiness and godliness, right? And let me say it a different way. Listen now, this is not a last generation teaching. It's not a last generation teaching. God's people have always been asked to be godly. Peter is just simply saying here, hold fast what God has always asked us to be. Stay faithful to it. Be the men and women God has raised you up to be. Be holy. Be in godliness and holy conduct. Now, now, uh, how do we do that? Knowing what we know. We know some things. Um, as Christians, we know our condition, don't we? Uh, the condition of, of, of humanity. We have sinful hearts. And I hope I'm not just talking about me. I think we all can recognize this, right? That's the human condition. We have sinful and selfish hearts. Heart. So how can we, how can we um, live holy and godly lives knowing that we have sinful and, and polluted hearts? Well, be, we don't just know the problem of this world. We also know the solution, don't we? And what is the solution to a sinful and troubled heart? Well, the solution is Jesus, right? The solution is to be born again. This is Christ's solution that he shared with us. You remember what he said to Nicodemus that night? He met with him secretly. And he told Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John, be born again. You need to be born again. He was talking to an educated man, a man who knew scripture, a man who could argue with the best, right? Nicodemus was a gifted man, but Jesus cut right to the, right to the heart of it, didn't he? He went right to the simple truth. You need to be born again. In fact, very directly, uh, truly, truly I say to you. So is Jesus telling us the truth here? Okay? He's saying this, you can bank on this, like my mom would say. This is true. Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This doesn't sound optional to me. Does it sound optional to you? We must be born again. To, be, to, to live in holy conduct and in godliness, we need to ask Jesus for new hearts. This needs to be our first mission in the morning. Lord, give me a, give me a heart like yours. Help me be born again. We need to ask for this, this miracle. Jesus was so direct with it. Be born again. Uh, uh, living, is, this, is this an important, essential truth for those of us living just before Jesus returns to ask him to be born again? We must be born again. Think of David's mournful confession. You know it. You don't have to look it up. Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is, this is, this is, the, this is the request of God's people. This is what we need to be focused on. In these last days in particular, I love the way Paul puts it. You can look it up later if you want. You can look it up now if you want. But in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, I love the way he puts this. You know, so, uh, Paul is, um, I don't know, he's just, he's, he's someone to look up to. But 1 Corinthians 16, 13, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. I don't know why I love that so much. I just love the directness of it. You know, stand up. Be, be strong. Act like men, right? This, it's time to be counted. I just love the directness of it. It's time to be godly men and women. It's time to live in holiness. It's time to be an Adventist. What about the second part of it? He says, uh, again, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for, looking for the coming of the day of God? God, looking 
for. We need to be watching and praying. And again, I'm going to boldly say we need to be an Adventist because this again is this is what characterizes us as a people. We are looking for the return of Jesus. I don't say that out of uh, any kind of bragging or um, uh, no. To be an Adventist, this is this is what we should be about. This is what we have been about traditionally, pointing people, looking for the return of Jesus. Is that still true today? Isn't it true? It's still a part of our name, isn't it? We need to be what God has called us to be. We need to watch and pray. Now, the word watch, you could substitute the word study there, and I think it works just fine. The study about the return of Jesus, to, to, to fixate on these things, to know them, but watch for them. Now, what do we watch? Well, according to Jesus, in Matthew 24, we know what to watch. I can look up in the eastern sky and all I see is clouds or blue sky or whatever. So that's not what I'm watching. What am I watching? I'm watching the signs. That's what Jesus said to do, right? His, his disciples came to him on the Mount of Olives. When are these sort of things happen? When's going to be the, 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 you know, the, uh, the end of the world and so forth? They asked a very direct question and Jesus started going through. And he talked about watching for these signs. He talked about what the world would look like in those days. And we know those signs, don't we? Don't we teach this? This is something we, we routinely teach. So much so, listen now, long-time Adventists, listen to me. We've taught it so many times, we're in danger of becoming numb to it if we allow ourselves to be. Right? We're, 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 we've heard it so long, it's easy to say, yeah, yeah, I've heard it before. Don't make that mistake. That's what the Pharisees did. And they missed Jesus. They missed the, the first coming of Jesus, right? Let's not miss the second coming of Jesus. We need to be watching and praying, looking with an eye toward rescue. Okay? Well, yeah, uh, Stephen Calloway, he saw the island. He was filled with joy. As he got close, he got nervous until he saw the Savior, until he saw his Savior. He saw his fisherman Savior, right? And we need to be aware of where we are. We need to be aware of the dangers, recognizing the closeness of our need, but always keeping our eyes on Jesus, looking at Jesus, looking at his promises, dwelling on his words. This is the activity, the essential activity of God's people living in troubled times. Never forget God's pattern, church. God's pattern is clear in the Bible. He always warns before executing judgment. We see that all the way back to the days of, of, of Noah and Lot and Pharaoh and Nineveh. The whole, all of the Bible stories tell us this. He always warns before executing judgment. And uh, certainly he has warned us. We know that, uh, where we are in Earth's history. We've got all the evidence we need from Scripture to know the, the drift of things. Jesus said uh, in Matthew 24, I already referred to Matthew 24, but this is verse 32. Learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Let me ask you, church, do we know that summer is near? Do we know that the return of Jesus is near? How can it not be? Look at the signs. He said, look, just look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of this tree, right? And I look at my world. I gave you a list. I gave you the top 10 whatever list from Google. And uh, even Google sees the signs. They just don't know what to do with that information. But we do if we follow God's word. We need to be watching and praying, paying attention to where we are, not in panic, not in hand-wringing, but doing what Christ asked us to do. Christ asked us to watch. Now, some might say why. In fact, I had a, I had a Bible student ask me this one time, maybe more than once, but one time I, that I remember, why watch if we know he's coming and we know we're in the last day? I don't get it. Why do we need to watch if we know he's coming? Well, the, the Bible tells us why we watch, and Jesus tells us why we watch. Uh, Revelation uh, 15, excuse me, 16, verse 15, Behold, I'm coming like a thief, Blessed is the one who stays awake. So there's a blessing with watching. I don't watch for more information. I watch because Jesus is telling us, and those are Jesus' words in Revelation, okay? The, the, there's a blessing in watching. It's good for me to watch. It's good to be blessed. Remember, it's good news. Don't forget that. It's good news. 
We're not waiting for a storm. We're waiting for Jesus, right? It's good news. Now, uh, this blessing and watching. Now, let me, I've talked about this many times from this pulpit. Let me just say it again. There is, um, I think that there's value in repetition. Um, now that I'm going to be entering the teaching world, I need to remember that. Repetition is a good thing, so bear with me. But I've talked many times about what a, a blessing is. We need to recognize this. What is a blessing anyway? The Bible mentions blessings so often uh, in, in, in this case, we're told that we're blessed, so let's understand what that means. Because sometimes I've, I've learned that, and, I, and I've thought this in my past too, to be blessed, oh, everything's good, I'm blessed, everything's good. That's not what a blessing is. Blessing isn't a promise of good things. Uh, now, a blessing is a good thing, but it doesn't always feel like a good thing. Okay? Because a blessing is not about how we feel. A blessing is, is being empowered to live out your created potential. That's what a blessing is. Go all the way back to creation. Do a study on blessing. I, 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 I promise this is what you'll find. A, a, to be blessed is to be empowered by our creator to live out what he created, to live out his design for me. And he blessed, he blessed everything he created. Go back to creation. He was blessed to do what it was created to do. To be blessed is to be empowered to live out your created design, your created potential. Okay? That's what it means to be blessed. Okay, my blessing will look different from your blessing because I was designed by God with a different purpose. So we can't compare blessings. How come he gets to be blessed? Your blessing is different. Your blessing is unique. Okay, so if we understand what a blessing is, then this, this is very important to me. If we're told we're blessed by watching, then what does that exactly mean? Well, what it means is watching empowers me to be ready. Can I say that again? Watching for Christ's return empowers me to be ready for Christ's return. There's a direct connection if I'm blessed. He's the creator is preparing me to be ready for it if I'm watching for it. This is what Jesus is saying. If you watch, you are blessed. I can't be blessed without God being involved. If I watch, God's involved in the process. He's going to do something in me that I need to be ready for that event. If I ignore God's return because I think I know all the information, I'm going to miss the blessing. I'm going to miss being prepared and empowered to receive it. We need to be watching for Jesus' return. We need to be paying attention. We need to stay awake. Isn't this what he asked his disciples to do in those closing hours of Jesus' life? He did what we all so easily do. They fall asleep. All right? He told the, the, uh, the parable of the virgins. You know the story. You know the warnings, right? Stay awake. Stay awake. Watch. There is a blessing in watching. We need to live ready. And, of course, associated with that is prayer. We need to be praying. And I wish I had more time to go into this in some great detail, but I've preached on it before, so I'll just remind you of things. You know, we often pray a very, very... You know, there are typical kinds of prayers that we pray. They're not bad prayers, don't, don't misunderstand. They're common prayers, and, I'm, and I pray them all the time myself, but we pray essentially for three things. We pray for success, we pray for security, and we pray for salvation. Those are the three general categories of prayer. We pray for success, success in our lives, success in our families, success in our ministries. We pray for God to, to help us be successful people of God, right? Nothing wrong with that. We should pray those prayers. We pray for success. We need to pray for security, all right? Lord, bless my children. Help them be safe on the road before we travel. Lord, help us to be safe. Help us to, uh, you know, help us to get this job. You know, we, we pray for the basic needs. Jesus taught us to pray like that. Ask for our daily bread. There's nothing wrong with that. We pray for security, right? And we also pray for salvation. Save me when you come, Lord. Save my children. Um, save my friends, save my church. So these are, these are the, the three categories of prayer that we typically fall into. All good things, but I want to suggest in the last days, we need to add something to the list. We need to be praying for judgment. Pray for judgment. Now, I know that that's, that's thinking that we often don't, it doesn't come natural in the modern world because we think of judgment as something scary. Is judgment scary according to God? It, let me say it differently. If you are a part of God's people, is judgment scary? No, judgment is making everything right. Judgment is bringing equity to a world that is out of balance, out of order, right? A broken world. Judgment is about God restoring things. We need to pray for that. We need to ask God. 
And this is biblical, by the way. We find it all through the, the, the scripture. We have certain, uh, certain categories that we see here. Uh, in Revelation chapter 6, the question is asked, How long, O Lord? This is the souls under the altar, you remember. But they pray this prayer. How long, O Lord? Come on, we've seen enough. How long until you deliver on your promise? That's a prayer that we need to get comfortable praying, church. How long, O Lord? What more needs to be seen? Now let me ask you, is that a bold prayer? It is a very bold prayer. But it's a biblical prayer. How long, O oh Lord? Lord, bring your... Read the Psalms. The Psalms is filled with this kind of refrain, right? How long, O oh Lord? Uh, when is your justice going to show up? You know, laying out the, the, the problems of our enemies, the problems of our world, and asking God to do something about it. That's a prayer that we, as God's people, in these last days, need to begin praying. Acknowledge evil. Acknowledge God's goodness. And then, of course, accepting the answer. At the end, we see that pattern all through the Bible, accepting God's wisdom, accepting God's judgment. Ask for it, and then accept it. Think about, open your Bibles. Turn to, turn to Luke 18. Luke 18. Look real quick here. Luke 18. This is a story Jesus told. And you know it well. Verse 2 is wrong with it. Well, I'll start in verse 1. Why not? Fear not, I see the clock. It's okay. Chapter 18, verse 1. He was, uh, now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. And then he goes into the story. In a certain city, there was a judge who did not care about God, did not respect man. And there was a widow in that city. And she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection for my opponent. Give me justice. A, a widow, a woman calling for judgment. All right? And for a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God or respect man, yet because of this widow, uh, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. Listen, Jesus told this story, not Pastor Roger. Jesus said, we need to pray like this. Wear out the judge. Wear him out, right? We need to be praying for justice. We need to be praying for judgment. Lord, how long? How long? Maybe, maybe God is waiting for a people to start asking for judgment. We always want to put judgment off as something to be feared off in the future. Boy, I hope I don't have to go through that. But that's not what we find in Scripture. We find in Scripture God's people saying, let's get on with it. How long, O oh Lord? It's time for justice. It's time for judgment. And we are a people who should not be afraid of judgment. We talk about it way too much. We teach it way too often to be afraid of it. We need to ask for judgment. Now, I'm talking to Roger, by the way, because I'm just like anybody else. There's that, that natural tendency that I grew up with as a child to be nervous about judgment. I need to rethink and long for judgment and ask for judgment. So this is, uh, this is what we talk about when we, we say, watch and pray. Watch for the, for the signs and then pray that it would happen. Pray that it would come soon. Pray for God to deliver justice to the world. Finally, let's look at our last short move of this sermon. Look, look at the last thing he talks about. This is Peter now. Not just looking for the coming of the day of the Lord, but hastening the coming of the day of God. Hastening it. What does that mean exactly? Again, I want to say something bold here. This is also saying be an Adventist because this is our mission. Our mission is to hasten the coming of Jesus. This is our mission. By the way, let me just say this. Uh, our mission is not to become so holy that Jesus is obligated to come back. That's not our mission. Now, are we holy? Yes. Has God called us to be holy? Yes. But that's not the condition Jesus laid out to return. Jesus tells us what our mission is. He said it himself. Preach the gospel of the kingdom to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end shall come. That's the mission. We don't have to define God's mission. Jesus told us what his mission is. In other words, we hasten the second coming not by being something, but by doing something. Hmm. We need to hasten it. And if you look up the word hasten in the Greek, speudo, speudo in the Greek. It's where we get our word speed from. In fact, the company Speedo gets its name right from this. Okay? Speudo. Speed. Hasten. 
And if you look on, if you, if you, if you do your, go to your lexicon, your Greek lexicon, you got, them on your, you got them on your computers, you can look to see all the variations, right? To urge on, to yearn for, to root for. I love that. To be rooting for it. To be yearning for it. This is what it's talking about. It's not just talking about chronology here. Let's make it move closer in the calendar. But to be hastening it means to be looking for it, rooting for it, urging it on, cheering for it. Mm. Is it possible? I'm just going to ask the question. I have no answer. Is it possible that part of the reason Christ hasn't returned yet is that his people don't really want him to? And that's a fair question. It's a question I dare you to ask yourself. Do I really want him to come back? I have learned that not every Christian, certainly not every Seventh-day Adventist, wants Jesus to come back. We talk about it, but what do we feel about it? It's a, it's, a, it's a fair question, and it's an important question. Do I really want him to return? Because it implies a lot of things. Okay, so ask that question. Do we really want him? Listen, we are God's people living in the last days. How shall we live? We need to be living, rooting for, yearning for, urging on the second coming of Jesus. If not now, when, right? If not now, when? Urge it on. Now, uh, <laughs> I mentioned Speedos here just a second ago. Uh, I'm sorry for whatever image that brings to your mind. But, but let me just say, um, it, it reminds me of Latani and I going to our kids' swim meets. And this, this helps me understand this hastening, the second coming. Um, you know, we, we chose to put our kids in, into the swim program. We didn't take them to Little League Baseball. We didn't do the soccer thing. We chose swimming as the sport our kids would grow up doing for all kinds of reasons I won't get into. But, um, you know, we took them to the swim class every day where they'd practice. And then we'd go to these swim meets through the summer about once a week. And let me tell you something. I'm just going to be honest with my friends here. There is nothing more boring on earth than a, a kid's swim meet. I mean, it's boring. And my kids would agree, you know. You just sit there. There's races going on. I'm not even watching until my kid's in the race, until my kid's in the race, and then it all flips. It's one of the most exciting couple of minutes you'll ever experience. I'm standing there along with all the other, pardon my language, idiot parents. We're all idiots, right? Go, go, you know, we're cheering, we're urging. They can't hear us, they're in the water, right? My son, my son told me, Dad, I know, I, you know I can't hear you, right? They hear it on the video after. latani has got the phone, and they watch it later, and they hear us screaming like banshees. We can't hear you, Dad. That's okay. You know I'm cheering. Yeah, I know you're cheering. Okay. But you're, we can't. Latanya, can we help it? You can't help it. You see, you just, it's, it's, it's a wonderful and weird thing. You can't help but urge it on. And boy, when they touch that wall first, oh, there, it's, it's, a, it's an adrenaline release. It's a wonderful thing. This is the image we need to have with, with the second coming of Jesus. Urging it on. Can I do anything to make it faster? That's not the point. The point is what it's doing in me. Do you understand? Urging it on does something in me. It doesn't change Jesus. It changes me. I need to urge it on for my sake. So that when he comes, I'm actually excited about it. Not like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Right? Urge it on. Cheer it on. It all changes when you have a rooting interest. Are you interested in Jesus' return? Do you have a rooting interest? Is there a loved one you want to see again? Is there a child you want to see saved in God's kingdom? Do you have a rooting interest in Jesus' return? I'm guessing the answer is absolutely yes. So let's root it on. Let's urge it on. Let's hasten the day. And that's what Adventism should be about. That's our first, that's the part, that's the first part of our mission. Urging it on. Anticipate it. Now listen, I, I, anticipating, that's, that's a wonderful concept. You know, when you anticipate something, there's benefits. There's, there's wonderful positive benefits. And I've learned this in preparing for vacations. I'll admit, I'm, I'm almost out of here. I'll just tell you, I look forward to vacations. Is that okay? I look forward to vacations like anybody does. Uh, when I was looking forward to my sabbatical, I took a sabbatical a couple years back, and planning for that, you know, it took a lot of planning. But what I found out is by planning for it and you know, working it out ahead of time, anticipating it, gave me a, sort of an extended vacation. I got to enjoy my vacation long before I started. Have you found that to be true? 
It, you know, by anticipating it, that's part of the fun for me. Oh, we've got this coming up. You're counting the days, you're preparing, you're looking for it, you're looking at maps, you're enjoying it before it ever happens. When we anticipate the kingdom of God, the same thing happens. We get, to, we get a piece of it right now. We get to enjoy some of the benefits early by talking about it, by thinking about it, by anticipating it. The benefits come before the action. Hold God accountable. I already talked about that. This is part of hastening. How long, O oh Lord? Hold Jesus accountable to his promise. He's not afraid of you to do that. He promised in John 14, right? He promised to come back. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, right? He promised to return. Let's hold him accountable. How long, Jesus? You said you'd come back. This is what it means to hasten his return. And also, and I'll finish with this, I promise, but we need to be spreading the hope. This is part of hastening his return, spreading the hope of Jesus. How do you spread the hope of Jesus? We talk about it, that's it. We just talk about it. When you have an opportunity to talk about the return of Jesus, take it. Think back of the, the technician who came to my house, talk about the trouble. I'm glad Jesus is coming back soon. This is what he said. I heard that. That's what he said. I heard that. He heard it. I didn't need to say any more. Talk about it. Because it builds hope in you. It might introduce hope in another. We need to talk about it. Hope is like the gospel. It's spread by human contact. Talk about it. Because that's when you know you believe it. If it's something you talk about. If it's something that every opportunity you say, this is going to happen. I'm looking for this to happen. I can't wait for this to happen. This is what, this is what it means to hasten the day. Because it's, now, it's near to me because I'm experiencing the benefits right now. It's actually literally brought it closer to me. By talking about it as a reality that I can begin to enjoy now. So what do we do? We look around our world. We turn on the news. It looks like, there's, it looks like the world's coming unglued. Because it is, right? Trouble on every side. Financial collapse. Political collapse. Violence. Cluelessness. How shall we live? Just like this. We need to live in holy godliness looking for and hastening the return of Jesus. How shall we live? Let's be Adventists. If not now, when? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for giving us the blessed hope of Jesus' return. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me, Lord, for living like we don't really believe it or for living like we don't really want it. And maybe that's only my prayer, but, but, but Lord, I suspect that in a group this size, there are some who can connect with that. Give us the, the courage and hope that we need to live like you've called us to live in these last days. To spend our last days on this earth, not in, in, in hand-wringing, but in anticipation, in hope. And Lord, I pray that, that you would help us to be the kind of people that when we come into contact with others, that hope spreads. The good news of Jesus is so real that our faces show it. Go with us, Lord, as we leave this place and as we go to our workplaces and our places of business, Lord, I pray that we live in holiness and godliness, looking for and hastening the day of rescue. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.